The following interview was conducted with Chris Foster for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, December 4th, 2007 at the Stewart Center uh, TV studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your early years and parents and siblings and grade school, etc. Well, hi, Catherine. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is uh, going to be a real adventure for me. Um, the uh, well, let me before we really get started here. Go ahead. Is is this edited, or, is, get, or is this going to be a uh, when you get a, a uh, verbatim kind of a thing? It'll be a, it's a conversation, and then when we have it, when I get the copy on the DVD, you can take a look at it if you want to take something out. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be fine. And, and so, uh, go if, ahead. if I stop and I lurch and so forth, that'll all be kind yeah. of smoothed out. Exactly. Oh, good. yes. Good, good, good. Well, that that makes me feel a little bit more relaxed. All right. So to answer your question about my early childhood, uh, basically I grew up in the Cleveland area, Cleveland, Ohio. I was born there. I spent uh, uh, actually all my pre-college and college days in the Cleveland area. So uh, that was... Uh, Tell us a little bit about uh, high school and grade school. And Do you have any siblings, brothers, or sisters? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I come from a, a family of, of five kids. Uh, four boys and and a girl, and I was the oldest in the in the group. Uh, right after I was born, my my uh, uh, my mother's French, and so uh, right after I was born, we actually spent uh, some time in Europe uh, with my dad finishing up his degree uh, at the University of Grenoble. And so my early days were actually uh, spent a lot like my wife uh, traveling around in uh, in France. Very nice. Yeah. Nice opportunity. It was it was terrific. I don't remember anything about it, but but that was my early upbringing. And so uh, what we did as as a family is we lived in Maple Heights, Ohio, which is southeast of, of Cleveland. It's a suburban area that was just sort of a post World War II uh, development with all the GIs coming back from uh, World War II. That was sort of what uh, what the period was for our family. So when I went. To, uh, to uh, school there, the the elementary school was right at the end of my street, so it was about a five minute walk, and there were parks right around the neighborhood, and it was just a great place to grow up for kids. I went to uh, junior high school and high school in Maple Heights, public schools. Uh, when it came time to go to college, I went to college on the the west side of Cleveland, uh, at Baldwin Wallace College, it's a small three thousand person school that. Uh, uh, was about 45 minutes from home, so it was a, a, a nice arrangement there. Did you live on campus? Yeah, I lived what on campus. What was campus like, and were you involved in some activities there? Uh, what what I uh, did in college was uh, uh, mostly sports, fraternity, and and science studies. That's kind of what I concentrated on. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, when uh, when I was in high school, I was a big track star, and so I got recruited to uh, be an athlete on this campus. And uh, uh, Baldwin Wallace is a very uh, tough athletic program at, at that Division three level. Back then, there was only two divisions, so we competed in Division two, but we're still tough at that, at that level. So I ran cross-country track and indoor track, and that was pretty much uh, what kept me busy uh, about every day of the year. Mm -hmm. And I belong to Alpha Sigma Phi fraternity, which uh, has uh, a chapter here at uh, Purdue. They actually invited us over to dinner, a very nice dinner, about a week ago. So it was Good. nice to connect back up with those guys. Good. And I was uh, a nurse science major, uh, which meant that I studied all of the, the sciences that had to do with the earth, geology, meteorology, astronomy, uh, all of those things. And uh, I graduated uh, with distinction from that major. I finally got out. What I actually did uh, uh, in, in my last year was to uh, was to change my direction slightly. The uh, uh, my junior year in college, uh, I ran into some old friends who uh, were mentor science teachers for me, and they were able to. Uh, uh, invite me to work with the National Science Foundation in Boulder, Colorado, working with science teachers in the summertime. 
they needed some people that knew how to use telescopes and, and could do geology and all that with these teachers because they were developing a new national curriculum in earth science called the Earth Science Curriculum Project. It was sponsored by the National Science Foundation. Very nice deal. So I was so impressed with that whole operation that my senior year in college, I uh, went back and uh, got certified to be a science teacher. So after I when I graduated, I graduated with that teaching degree and was able to go right from there and, and uh, teach for about 25 years in the public schools in uh, secondary uh, science. When you graduated, did you start work teaching in Cleveland or? Um yeah, I taught in Cleveland for about three years in, in a little suburb uh, to the east side of Cleveland called uh, Chagrin Falls. Actually, just a little outside of Chagrin Falls, a place called Kenston Schools. It's a bedroom community mostly for, uh, for Cleveland professionals. A lot of people from Case Western Reserve uh, uh, lived out there, but very nice. But very soon after that, I was recruited nationally uh, at some very good places, and I eventually settled in Los Alamos, New Mexico as their, uh, their science teacher. Oh, very. Now you had some. You've done some postgraduate work. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. New Mexico? Did you? You have a master's degree as well. How about your graduate work? Yeah. So uh, while I was uh, teaching in Los Alamos, uh, I was able to uh, get fellowships to do graduate study at the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology. It's the New Mexico uh, uh, Tech School. And that, that's down in Socorro, in a place where most people have never heard of before, but sort of in the geographic center of the state. Um, and uh, I finished that degree. And in, in teaching, if you have a master's degree in, in that subject area, then uh, you're not required to do anything anymore for your advancement as, as a teacher. In general, at least back in the old days there, they they always expected you to be taking a, a course or two. And I was doing that anyway, but I just thought that having that master's degree would be a nice thing to do. Very good, okay. Well, how, did, um, how long were you at Los Alamos then? Were you, did, you were there, there full time? To, and what exactly was the nature of, you were doing some teaching there? Oh yeah, to, yeah. So what I, what I did uh, in Los Alamos was that I was the, uh, the high school science teacher in town. Very one good. of them. Yeah, very good. And, and uh, during the summertime, uh, I would consult with the lab. We'd always run uh, some interesting science education programs for uh, uh, local students or uh, teachers. And they also had a great program for uh, science teachers in town where they would uh, employ you at the laboratory, uh, actually working in a research group. So I got to do a lot of projects over the summers with them. They, they, in Los Alamos, it's fairly isolated, and so they just like to utilize all of the able-bodied hands. Sure. How large, a how large is the community there? And the people that work there also live in this community? Yeah, Los Alamos, uh, just before I arrived, had opened the gates. Prior to that time, you had to have a security clearance to live in town, and you had to, if you, if you were just sort of a day person, you had to come through. You couldn't live in town. You had to come through and, and uh, have some identification. But it was still fairly small. I think that there's probably 20,000 people in, in the town and in, uh, and in the, the one suburb we had, White Rock, that's what it's called. It's down mm -hmm. by the Rio Grande uh, River, the Rio Grande Gorge. Very good. Well, let's talk a little bit about following your career path following the completion of the Masters. And then I know your real interest is in students, which is great, mm -hmm. and which you've been really involved in. So tell us a little bit about that. And um, then I'm interested also in that uh, globe, that global learning and observation. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, after living in Los Alamos for about 20 years, I ran into uh, my spouse, France Cordova, and uh, very soon thereafter, we af after we got married, uh, we and we had a few kids. She got an offer to teach at Penn State. And so uh, we moved the family back to State College, and that was, that was a real adventure. But I found out that I had had enough uh, science teaching at the secondary level, and I decided I was going to work at, uh, at the college level. So at Penn State, uh, I was hired to run a, uh, a STEM improvement program called the New American Scientist Initiative. 
And that was a lot of fun because it actually has the same themes of what we have right now in the business. We're concerned about not having enough able-bodied majors and to be able to retain the uh, the good majors that we have in those those areas. Those areas, yeah. Sure. So I, I did that for uh, for several years. We, we made all kinds of interesting things happen. Um, and uh, at after uh, being in uh, at uh, Penn State for about four or five years, uh, France was uh, offered the position as chief scientist at, at NASA. And originally she was planning on leaving our young family, who, who at that point were in elementary school, the, the, uh, uh, in State College and, and letting me complete uh, a, a doctoral degree that I, that I was working on mm -hmm. at that point. But at the last minute she decided no, rather than her commuting uh, each week, she would uh, actually just drag us all down to Washington, D.C. It turned out to be a nice thing because uh, Washington, D.C. is just kind of a great thing. So I completed everything with my with my doctoral degree. I'd taken all the coursework. I'd passed my candidacy. I, my committee had approved my first couple chapters in my research and everything. And so uh, when uh, we left, I left my research uh, interview tapes with somebody to transcribe, and, and they lost those. And so, so I, I was sort of it was sort of a bad decision on my uh, for me. To, to make that move to Washington, D.C., because things sort of broke down a little bit. But uh, I looked around for about six months and uh, found some interesting things to do in Washington and finally uh, found this GLOBE program, which was uh, being organized uh, right at that point. So they were looking for someone who uh, uh, had the science education background that I did, uh, had been a teacher, and uh, knew about environmental education and was fairly technically savvy with uh, computers. So uh, very, uh, very nice uh, combination right at that point. Uh, and it was exciting because uh, I got to work in downtown in Washington. Uh, we had a, a townhouse just off of uh, Lafayette Square, which is right in front of the White House. We had one of the Jackie Kennedy townhouses that was uh, uh, vacated by the Council on Environmental Quality. So my job uh, was uh, the deputy uh, for program design for uh, the GLOBE program. Uh, originally, uh, the uh, Sandy, whose last name escapes me right now, Sandy Berger, some, something like that. Uh, advisor to. Uh, Sandy Berger, was it security advisor or something of that sort? Well, no, he, he oh. was the He's the director of the uh, the NOAA oh, Thunderstorm right. Laboratory okay. in Boulder, Colorado. He wrote the strategic plan for uh, Al Gore's I idea from uh, Earth in the Balance. He uh, took that chapter out of out of there on his global Marshall Plan mm -hmm. for doing uh, ed educating students about environmental change. And uh, he actually worked on it in that townhouse by himself over the summer. So we took that, that strategic plan and we were able, uh, and were able to put together an interagency kind of a, of a program. What that means is that we, was that we had uh, uh, NOAA, the, the agency that had hired me, works, they, they're under the Department of Commerce. They, they're the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So they do the weather satellites and the oceanographic vessels and that sort of thing. Um, and we had NSF, and we had education, we had NASA, we had EPA. All of the, those agencies contributed some Jeez, folks to put this thing together. And uh, so my job was to be the deputy to the chief scientist for NOAA, uh, Kathy Sullivan. Kathy Sullivan was the first uh, woman to uh, first American woman to walk in space. I think she may have been the first woman, period, I don't know. Something like that, sure. but she's still a very good friend. And uh, of course, she's very busy, so I got to do a lot of organizing of meetings and the, and the facility itself. And uh, we eventually got to the point where we had a program in about over 100 countries. 
and in several thousand schools around the, the country. And so we shifted into a, a, a mode of, of, uh, of maintenance, and that was about my third year there, and I became a deputy for education for the program or something like that, running the, sort of a national training program and, and developing the curriculum in all the different areas of environmental measurements. So that was quite thrilling to be able to uh, work with all those folks in, in a real life science education program. And what the best thing that we did, I think, in that program that I can say a little bit more about that. Please do. Uh, is that we were right uh, at the start of uh, the World Wide Web and computers being used in science classrooms. So the subtext of the GLOBE program was to really bring the internet to the schools. That was sort of a, a big idea behind that. And so uh, much of what we were doing was to actually have workshops where we taught teachers how to use computers. That's right. In order to be able to use the program. That's right, in order to be able to uh, actually uh, take measurements of the environment around their school and to uh, use the web to report those with their students. And so at that point, schools weren't on the web. And so we, we had a very nice uh, introduction to all that for our country and for a lot of countries in the, the world that signed bilateral agreements with us uh, that allowed uh, their countries to actually be using the web to transmit scientific information. Particularly a lot of African countries had never done that before and right. so there was a lot of uh, high-level diplomatic kinds of things going on with this program. So it's a really nice, uh, education is always a nice entree into a lot of interesting things. Mm -hmm. Did you have to do? Did you do much traveling in conjunction with this to, uh, inter, uh, outside the United States with the program? Oh, we ha we had a, a branch oh. at this point. The the program had matured in these few years that I was there, so that we actually had an international group that just concentrated on that, uh, and so we had international training and 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 my my role was to really work the American teachers and schools and and so I did a, a lot of running around in our country actually more running around than I needed to do having uh, young kids and a very active wife. Sure. How old were your children at that time? Well they were uh, in elementary school sort of uh, beginning elementary school they were probably up to about grade four or something uh -huh. like that yeah. yeah. Lots of things to expose them to in Washington a lot of things activities. Oh yeah to go. yeah they actually uh, 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 wouldn't go after a while because there, there's so much. But the one place that we could always take them was the uh, the American Museum of uh, the the National Museum of American History down on the mall. And the reason they would go there is that they have a full size soda fountain from the 50s that's that's there that actually works. So you go in and you can order sundaes and malts and. And so they would go for that. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, what was your next date then, sir, after, after that, after, from California, or after Washington, D.C.? Then where did you go next? Well, let me grab a quick <coughs> sip here. Sure. The what? Didn't, excuse me. Didn't you take them to the Smithsonian? That seems to me there might, there might have been some things there in the Smithsonian. Oh, that's okay. right. The, the, the Smithsonian. Is, there's so many is lots, lots of different institutions around the mall, sure. and so the National Museum of American History is part of the Smithsonian. Oh, that's right. I'd forgotten about that. We uh, we did we did lots of things. Like uh, the most visited museum in the world is the Air and Space Museum right. on the mall. Yes. What we would do, particularly because of France's connection with the uh, uh, with NASA, is we would have big events at six o'clock after the Air and Space Museum closed down. So there's millions of square feet in there, it seems. Very high ceilings. Great, I've seen pictures. Great, uh -huh. great places to have uh, events. And uh, they would have fabulous food and drinks and desserts. And it was all very, all paid for with American tax dollars. Very uh, fancy. Very social. <laughs> very fancy stuff. And the people that would be uh, invited were all the, the folks from the congressional districts, the staffers, the all the sort of the movers and shakers. So one event I can describe is uh, we had uh, the uh, premiere of uh, the new uh, 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 
the large scale movies, Omnimax is whatever whatever yeah. those things are called. We had uh, the premiere of that in the Air and Space Museum in their in their big theater, and uh, the the theme of it was um, the new International Space Station, and so the the main folks that were there were uh, that were uh, premiering that where we had a lot of astronauts, sure. but we had uh, Al Gore and his family and the premier, or the vice premier of Russia at that time, whose name escapes me. So it was a school day. We brought the kids down, and we were, of course, sitting right in the middle, in the row, right in front of the the Soviet uh, premier and and the the Gore family. And the kids were just, you know, elementary school kids. They were tired, and they didn't really care who was there. But it was long because everything that Al Gore would say would have to be translated, in by the uh, because there was actually a large party of uh, of Russians there, and then in turn the the Soviet representative had all his stuff translated into English. So it goes pretty slow. But it was just great, a wonderful party, and, uh, and Washington, D.C. had all that kind of stuff going on all the time. So the kids were uh, exposed to quite a few things they, like that. They, they had a lot of stuff like that going on, yeah. Yeah, oh, right, okay. Um, does the next thing then, would you go, when you left there, was it Santa Barbara, is that where you what, uh, tell us a little bit, about, and you were involved in, uh, I'd like to know about that academic outreach coordinator and the regional director of that uh, California Arts Bridge program. Okay. Very interesting. All right. So when we uh, uh, got to about three years in Washington, D.C., France had signed up for that kind of a term away from her, uh, her job at Penn State. So she, she had signed up for an IPA kind of a thing, which is... Uh, uh, which was sort of release time, and the government was paying Penn State to pay her while she was in Washington, D.C. And so rather than going back to uh, Penn State, we, we were ready to try something different, and so uh, France accepted the position at, at UC Santa Barbara, which is a, a great spot. It's right on the Pacific Ocean, and, and uh, she was, uh, uh, the position she took was Vice Chancellor for Research, which is like a Vice President kind of a role uh, at, uh, at Santa Barbara. She was also the, uh, in the uh, physics department, which is one of the best physics departments in the country. There's a good physics uh, institute there called the Institute for Theoretical Physics, which is really well uh, uh, visited. We always had folks around for months at a time, like Stephen Hawking and so forth. So mm -hmm. very, uh, very uh, nice spot. and. Uh, and I, I'm kind of dithering here a little bit, but sure. so my role uh, coming off of this GLOBE program was to work with uh, the campus to see if they could uh, do a little better job in, in working with the local schools. The uh, problem with having a major research university in a small place like that is that they always, uh, the community always thinks that the campus is not doing enough for the local schools. So they have this uh, uh, institution on the hill kind of effect. So when I arrived, everybody told me that, that the campus wasn't doing anything. Uh, but when I talked to the faculty on campus, I found out they were doing a lot. So we very quickly were able to uh, have uh, teacher meetings and meeting with meetings with principals. We came up with some good websites, some annual publications, and lots of things to engage the schools, most of which were already being done. but. After a year or so, uh, the community no longer felt that the uh, campus was aloof and not doing enough for their students. They, they knew that there was plenty that the campus was engaging in to help mm -hmm. the, the local schools. And mm -hmm. so that was, that was sort of my role there. And uh, uh, one of the, the most effective ways to engage uh, the local schools was the Arts Bridge program that you, that you mentioned yeah, just, right. uh -huh. just uh, a, a bit ago. So that program was at all of the UC campuses, uh, and we had a regional area that, that we did Arts Bridge in, and uh, the way that worked was that we had uh, students in the arts uh, apply for fellowships. I think there were like $1,000 per quarter fellowships, so the UC system is mostly on the quarter system. Uh, and their job was to work with a classroom teacher uh, on some 
some of their art with uh, the classes. So a lot of it was at the at the elementary level, but they were junior high school and, and high school projects. And it was all the arts. Uh, Santa Barbara actually has nearly as many art students as, as uh, UCLA does. UCLA's sort of the biggest arts program in the UC system, but they've got twice as many students, and yet they've only got maybe a few hundred more uh, arts majors. So we got, <coughs> excuse me, we, got, we had the best art students at Santa Barbara competing for these fellowships. And a significant number of those were so excited because we also had the, the best uh, teachers in the system working with us. Uh, as mentors for these students, that a significant number of those students actually decided that they wanted to go right into teaching in the public schools. So it was a, a very exciting program, actually taking the best students that you have in, in their major and putting them into right. uh, the, the classroom. Yeah, that's very good. So that, that was a success. Yeah, you were the, um, that was, so the educational outreach is really what they were referring yeah. to. Yeah, we, we had ac academic outreach is what we called it. Right, it, and they still, is that still going on? Well, uh, somewhat. They, they uh, the folks that, that ended up taking that program uh, weren't able to keep up the same level because what I was able to do is write a lot of grants and so we're bringing in like a half a million dollars a year to support all these different programs. And they didn't have anybody to take my place on that. Mm. So that makes a difference. Yeah, oh, that's right. So that, right. not having that, that level of support, they, uh, they just weren't able to maintain it, yeah. You have a pretty good contact with the students that you were working with, both in, 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 the, in the college as well, the university, working with the students too, in, this, in conjunction with this outreach being the coordinator? That's right. Doing the ArchBridge program, it was, it was absolutely working with the students. I would go out and, and watch them do their, their thing in the classrooms, and we had briefings, and we had parties, and we had lots of things going on. So it's always fun to be with the students. But with all the programs we did, we tried to make sure that the undergraduates had an opportunity to be doing something with those teachers. Sure. What's the size of the campus there? It's about uh, maybe 18,000. Oh, okay. So it's pretty small. Is it a primarily commuter or do people live do they live on campus or is it some of both? Most everybody lives in it at Santa Barbara. Uh -huh. you, you see Santa Barbara is actually the the most desirable UC campus right now in terms of, of applications received. It, in the last couple of years it's eclipsed uh, Cal Berkeley as the most popular one for students to apply to. Oh, Everybody cool. wants to live there because it's built right on the, the beach. So for instance, for lunch, I would take my mountain bike out and I would just be able to ride along the, uh, the bluffs above the Pacific. Or I could jog along the beach and stop in the middle and go swimming and then jog back to the, um, uh, to the gym. Oh, sounds good. <laughs> we'll have to take you along the trails here. We've got oh, some yeah. trails so, here, right? Uh, all the students in California wanted to attend UC can, Santa Barbara. The env environment is very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I understand then you went to Riverside was next, and then you were the uh, director of undergrad research and the student professional organization. Was that two different things? And tell well, us a little bit about that. Uh, at, uh, at Riverside, France was the chancellor, and uh, so, uh, and I, I certainly wanted to, to move there, even though it's only maybe two hours from where we, we lived. So we, we didn't want to have a two, two position, two locale kind of a family there. Uh, and so w what, what they had open at that point in, in Santa Barbara was something slightly different than what I, or, I mean at Riverside, was something slightly different than what I'd done before. It was working in the College of Engineering with the undergraduates. One of the big uh, goals there at that time was to really capitalize on uh, the undergraduate research possibilities uh, on the whole campus, but particularly in engineering. And so uh, that was the program that I developed, was getting more students into undergraduate research that were engineers. The, the, the reason for that is that uh, it's clear that the students that are doing things as undergraduates early on are able to find more interest in their fields and, and they tend to stay there longer. So there's a real impact on sure. retention of these STEM students. 
And also, there's just a lot of students that, that come to uh, a Research One university like, uh, like Riverside because they know that they're going to have that kind of an opportunity. And so to make those available to these students was, uh, was a big thing. And again, I was writing grants. We had lots of REU programs. We had major um, uh, symposia like Southern California Conference for Undergraduate Research that uh, the National Science Foundation supported. And, and so I was able to do a lot of the things that I've always done, but just focus that attention on the, uh, the uh, undergraduate engineers on campus. Mm -hmm. Part of, of my operation, though, was to do things that would, to do models in engineering that could be used for the whole campus. And so by the time we left last year, we had the first undergraduate research journal that the campus had ever done. So we published that last June, in June 07. And that was just great because uh, everybody wants to have that kind of a publication on campus. And so that was not just for the engineers, but it was for everybody on campus. And we also had the first campus-wide undergraduate research symposium. I was going to ask you about for, that. For all majors, uh, that, that is uh, an annual kind of a thing that we systematized since we had our first official one. Even though we'd hosted one that, that uh, the Southern California Conference, which brought in 95 different schools and 1,000 different students in all majors. They're, they had never actually done one on uh, at the UC campus, at the UC Riverside campus before, just for their students. And so, uh, so uh, everything that I try to do, I try to generalize, not beyond the unit that I'm in, and I try to, I try to take it to the whole campus. If it's a good idea, then everybody should be able to right. benefit by that. The undergraduate research, was that only for the engineering or was that campus-wide to focus on for the, under, for the research for the The undergrad? students that I worked with day in and day out were the engineers, okay. but if the mathematicians came over, I, I would certainly sure. uh, talk to them. And I tried to open up all of our events to the whole campus. But the events uh, that, uh, that I just described, the undergraduate research journal and the, the first annual campus-wide undergraduate research symposium in the spring, uh, those were for everybody on campus. Oh, that sounds, that, I imagine the students enjoyed working on that journal. They're the ones that were their, their oh, research Oh, they were reports. thrilled. They were thrilled. Great we, experience. We, we had uh, a ha about a half a dozen uh, students that were editing, editing it because it is a student-edited journal. And they're the best students, and they worked very hard, and they were thrilled when that thing was was published. We had a very nice party at the Chancellor's residence to roll that out, and all the faculty that had helped them. It was a, a big event. Oh, absolutely! It's more more than worth it, right? <laughs> Tell oh, us about, yeah. yeah, very very nice. Um, teaching any uh, your challenges or uh, your interaction with the students in teaching. Comment a couple of bit on that. Uh, any um, your challenge and, and your style. Any. Share some of your comments on that. Well, uh, I, I have to reach back to uh, to Riverside or to uh, uh, previous jobs because so far here at uh, at Purdue, my my main uh, contact is with faculty researchers. Okay. Um, in in the the one thing that I'm doing now that that meets regularly with students is the president's leadership class, which is fr which are freshmen that are given a $1,000 uh, fellowship each semester to uh, attend uh, sessions with the president and me and, and, uh, and lots of invited leaders and uh, uh, professionals from around the, uh, the state. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so uh, what, I, what I find is that the students are all the same. They all want to do the best they can. They've got good attitudes. They uh, are curious. And if they're allowed to, uh, to uh, get involved in a subject, then usually they, they like it a lot. All right, sounds good. Uh, and then tell us a little, uh, the new program that uh, you're, you're the director of the science education. Tell us a little bit about that for the researchers. See, a lot of this material, the future researchers studying the history of the university will be able to benefit by that. So this is a, this is a relatively new program, is that correct? Well, that I, I can say that, uh, that the title for my 
my role here is director of uh, P12 STEM programs at Discovery Park. So P is actually meaning pre pre preschool, like uh, before kindergarten. So uh, the the idea of of having uh, a program like that is that the uh, Discovery Park folks are making discoveries. They're doing things that should benefit all of society. And so my role is to try to bring some of that to bear with uh, pre-college education, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education. So the, the problem that I have is that the Discovery Park is not like uh, a large college, like ag, for instance, with lots of faculty and staff and classrooms and laboratories. We have uh, a few faculty and, and uh, graduate students and very specific laboratories that are aimed at the projects we're trying to work at sure, and no classrooms. And so uh, it's a whole different kind of a thing. So we don't have the same carrying capacity at Discovery Park that a, um, a college would have or large department. I understand. So when I, when I look at Purdue, uh, I see uh, tremendous programs in STEM education, pre-college STEM education across the university. And I have to compare to what I had at my last place at, at, at UC Riverside, and it, there's far more here than there is back there. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's a lot going on in that area. So I see my role as trying to set up a program that will uh, match the desires of the faculty at Discovery Park and the carrying capacity. And to have uh, uh, programs that'll have uh, an impact on the state of, of Indiana and can serve as a national model. So you can't do everything. Right. So you really have to be careful how you pick this out. And you also want to pick out something that's going to be uh, fundable because we want all this to be uh, funded by uh, by grants. Right, and that's a challenge. There are many challenges well, with this. Well, I think there's I think there's a lot of this is a very interesting topic, and so it's if you accept money from somebody, then that means you have to do that, and so you just have to be careful who you're going to accept this money from, and so that's why you have to be very strategic about how that's going to go. But I don't I don't think funding these programs will be any problem at all. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, and uh, tell a little bit about your hobbies and special interests. Are you still doing some, I understand, I know you people did rock climbing. Do you still do that? Well, since we had kids, we really cut back on that a lot. I remember the last time we were in Yosemite National Park, and the kids were still pretty young, and we were taking them up some uh, climb on the granite there on uh, the Monday morning slabs. And it wasn't very difficult, but they were just, pretty excited about that. And we hiked about halfway up to Half Dome, which is about, probably about a 17 mile round trip kind of a thing. And there's a lot of up on that. And so I think our kids, once they get a little older, they'll probably be interested in that stuff again. But I think that maybe we burned them out early. <laughs> so uh, right now, I think that uh, we're looking forward to hopefully having a little snow here and going cross country skiing. Sounds good. And I think that we're looking forward to being able to uh, just uh, enjoy the outdoors here. So we, we've been canoeing on the tip of canoe, and we've been down to Turkey Run, and we've checked out the river there, and so we want to do that next year. We brought our canoe with us. Oh, very so good. So we have that to put out on the water. Uh, so that'll be fun, and hopefully we bought France a bike, and so she'll... Uh, Where's she'll, yours? Well, or you already have one. Oh, yeah, I've got... I've got my bike, and so we'll hopefully get out a little bit more. Uh, that should be very good. We'll yeah. look for you on the trail. Yeah. <laughs> do you partic Do you still participate in the in your alumni at Baldwin Wallace or? or uh, yeah, no? yeah, a, a bit. Good. Yeah, and I think I mentioned that that the Alpha Sigma Phi fraternity here right. on campus had us to dinner a few weeks ago. Which is very nice. Yes. Are you st you're still on, are you still on the NOAA board on the national board with NOAA? The, you were the deputy director there. Were you, are you still involved with that at all or not? Well, that was that only... was my, my job with GLOBE, basically. Okay. So what, when we left Washington, D.C., I had to give up my government job, which is hard to do because government jobs are, are very hard to get. Right. And uh, 
So anyway, uh, I always seem to uh, uh, have to give up something when we move. <laughs> we pick up something <laughs> along the way then, right? Oh, the first day on the July 16th, tell us a little bit about uh, our first day on campus. Well, it was great. We, we, had, uh, we had taken a one-day vacation this summer because... Uh, Where was the one-day vacation? Well, it was in Santa Barbara. Oh, okay. So what, what happened was that the uh, schools that, that we worked with in California are uh, quarter-based schools. So uh, they finish in the middle of, of uh, June, okay? For that quarter. Yeah, that quarter is over in the middle of June. So we finished that up and we had the following week to get all these summer programs that, that I operate going, all the, the REUs, Research Experience for Undergraduate Programs going. And then we had the following week to be able to pack up our house. We had a chancellor's residence on campus at, at UCR. And, uh, and then we had one day left over. And so we drove up to Santa Barbara, spent the night with a friend of ours, and then drove back the next day and jumped on the airplane and we got in here uh, Saturday afternoon. Okay. And then Monday, the 16th of July, we started. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're a little uh, disconcerted here. We just didn't quite, we were a little uh, jet lagged, I think. But it was great because we had a big ice cream party. Which was very nice. On yes. the steps of Hovde and, and uh, France was very excited. So she got around everybody she could. I sure. think there were a couple thousand people there. Right, it was a very nice event. I shook a lot of hands and I still have people telling me, oh, I met you uh, on your first day. And, and I always say, really? <laughs> <laughs> don't you, or don't you remember you met me at so and so? I said, oh yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it's a tough one there. Yeah. If, the, if, if, the if the groups are smaller, I do better. Yeah. The uh, search process, were you involved in the uh, presidential search process? Uh, were there any inter for the interviews with it? Were you involved in it uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the, in the presidential search that your wife is the president? Well, I, I think that uh, close to the end, I, I, I was brought out. I think it was the, the, a spring weekend in April, and we, we uh, had lunch with the board, and they asked me a few questions, and they asked if, if uh, France was uh, offered the position, whether I would actually come out from Southern California. And so what I told them was that as long as I didn't have to shovel the driveway, because my, my, uh, we had a big driveway in State College when we were at Penn State, and my, my left shoulder is still very arthritic from all that s snow shoveling. And, and they said, don't worry about it. You don't have to do any snow shoveling here. It West Lafayette. Well, <laughs> doesn't snow very often, but sometimes it does. So we ha we'll have somebody plow the driveway. <laughs> you need it. Sign me up, right? <laughs> oh, and you know that the first gentleman, and that that's kind of a nice title. Yeah, uh, I, I like that a lot. It, yeah. When when it was first approached, what did you make? Uh, did they? Uh, what was your thoughts? Well, at at um, in the UC system, they actually have an official title that it's goes along with the, the, spouse. the spouse of, the, of nice. the chancellor. And it's called, let me see if I can remember it now, uh, Associate of the Chancellor. And it's, it's a legal kind of a, a term because you have, in order to travel and have insurance and, and all of the stuff you have to do in order to uh, do all the, the events that are involved in, in this role. Sure. Uh, because there's lots of people that report to make everything happen, uh, there's uh, you have to have some kind of an official thing. I understand. And so I think Patty Jiski here had a, a title as I'm trying to remember what what it was, but it was conferred upon her after many years of service here, uh, and uh, so it's a slightly different setup here. But uh, we talked about what my title should be, and, and I thought First Gentleman sounded about right. They, they didn't want to make it uh, the, the title that I had in the UC system for some reason. Whatever. But, uh, uh, but I thought that would, be, that would be fine as well. But First Gentleman is perfect. Right. When I'm introduced, I, I stand and, and I smile and I wave to everybody after I've been introduced as the First Gentleman. So that's, 
a big part of my role here. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, and <laughs> you're getting used to the Purdue traditions, and I, I think you do, I've seen you at the games and doing the flag and everything. Yes. You know, it's been. Yes. I, yeah. I, I'm, you, uh, does Riverside have the athletics like we have here? We, our football team was undefeated for about 35 years. Oh. The, the last That's season that we had was back in the 1970s in football. Oh. And that team was undefeated. Several of those players went into the pros, and, and many of them are athletic directors and their coaches. It was a fabulous season. But unexpectedly, at the end of that season... This is in the 70s you're talking about. This is in the 70s. Okay. The, uh, the chancellor then just abolished the program. So they've been undefeated since then. <laughs> That's a good one. That'll go down the tape then. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, out, um, your legacy, um, one of the things that we hope to be able to do when uh, and we're leaving, then we would like to do a follow-up. But what do you think about legacy when you leave, uh, legacy to you? Well, it's like the, the examples that I gave from uh, UC Riverside. Mm -hmm. what, what I try to do is is to... Uh, make an impact on the overall institution. I like to, to develop programs that are very well thought out, that will have a lasting impact, particularly in science and engineering, and that, that benefit the students that are going to be coming through here uh, in, in time. And so hopefully we'll have some interesting new things that, that the campus will support and that uh, will be considered uh, to be important uh, things for the students. That sounds good. Any questions that I haven't asked that you'd like to, any closing comments you'd like to share? Uh, well, so far, uh, after four months here, I think that uh, our impression, both France and my impression, is that, that Hoosiers are very friendly, and, and I'm finding they're very supportive. I'm having a great time. Everybody seems to want to help me to do my job better. And I have to say, I've probably never had this kind of uh, great support before. Most of the time, when you try to do something, folks are there to sort of get in your way. But here, uh, nice. I find that the Purdue folks just want to be helpful. Great. Well, that's very kind. Thank you very much. This concludes it. And thank you, Chris. We appreciate that. Thank you that. so much. This My is pleasure. just great. This is wonderful. <laughs>